Hellbound is a nautical themed area influence control game where players take on the role of seafarers as they manage a crew, manage workers and embark on a competitive sailing adventure into the Isle of Ryan Lockett's imagination. Islebound is designed by Ryan Lockett. It's published by Red Raven Games. It's for two to four players. Each game plays in about 60 to 120 minutes. It is an area influence and area control game using modular boards. Players conquer islands using pirates and sea serpents, or they gain diplomacy and influence and ally with other isles. The goal of the game is for players to race competitively, to build buildings, complete events, improve their reputation, and thereby also being simply the richest seafarer there is. Set up a game of Islebound, take the four central hex tiles and shuffle them up, and place them on the table as shown. You now should have constructed a unique looking map. When playing with the advanced version of the game, you play with the side that's marked with this symbol. Give each player a shipboard, a ship standee, three workers, one with the administrate symbol, two with the hand symbol, seven coin, and cubes that correspond with their ship's colour. Players mark their starting ship speed by placing a cube in the top corner of their ship board. Ensure that their crew is on deck. If the crew is ever below the deck, it means they are exhausted. So everybody, welcome to the Renown board. Players mark their position on the Renown track by using these coloured cubes. For every seven Renown that a player earns in a game, they gain one of these Renown tiles. And these Renown tiles give players extra resources um, and bonus effects, plus the tiles worth seven points at the end of the game when you're scoring. This is where you hire your crew. Obviously, the first person here is free. This is the treasure map. So whenever players visit an aisle, they need to pay an entry fee in order to gain the bonus from that aisle. So the entry fee gets paid to this treasure map. Down here is the influence marker track. Whenever players go to a particular aisle and complete an objective, these influence cubes are added in the first available space. Now, because I'm playing a two-player game, I've had to block out the first two spaces. I spoke to the tavern owner in Zillum, and he says there's this really big rat problem. I guess he can have our fish haul for the day. This here are the objectives if you go to Farwold, and they trigger extra bonus renown points. So players will then need to set up the building track by placing five buildings face up in a row from the building deck. Notice that these three buildings have a book icon above it. Those book icons signify the fact that if you want to purchase these buildings, you will need to have acquired that many books. At the end of the game, a player who builds eight buildings first triggers the final round. Players then select their starting ports by placing a cube of their color and a ship in that location. On a player's turn, players may move their ship any number of spaces up to their ship's maximum speed limit. Here signifies how many spaces you can move per turn. Now, if throughout the game you acquire workers that have the wave symbol, your speed then increases. But these workers need to remain on the deck of your ship. As soon as that worker is exhausted by going below the deck, your ship's speed becomes reduced. If a player ever moves into a space where another player is already occupying, that player needs to exhaust one worker with the administrative ability on their shipboard. In Ryan Lockett's two-player variant, if the ship enters the same hex tile as another player, that player needs to exhaust a worker with the administrative ability. They then can choose one of the following actions. Visit an aisle by paying its cost, attack an isle, especially if it has a red banner, use diplomacy to influence an isle with a blue-green banner, or simply collect the treasure from the treasure map. They then get to choose two free actions, either build a building or resolve an event card by trading in the necessary resources. They say that the grotto has the greatest abundance of fish, whereas Rat's Nest has full of scumbag pirates. When a player chooses to visit an isle, they pay this entry cost on this brown banner before they gain the isle's bonus effects. If an opposing player owns the isle, the money goes to them. If no one owns the isle, the money goes to the treasure map. They say that intelligence is power, but money buys you options. 
Players may choose to make an attack on an isle and attempt to conquer it by using their pirates or their sea serpents. Players can only choose to attack isles that have the red banner on them. When declaring attack, players select from their pool of pirates and serpents the ones that they wish to use. After declaring an attack, I take the amount of dice equal to the number of cards I'm using and roll them. And then I would now allocate the dice to the cards. Now this number here, if I get a one or more, I can get one attack damage through. If I get a four or more, I can get two attack damage value. For this sea serpent, if I get three or more, I can get two attack damage. And if I've got five or more, I get three attack damage. So I think I'll probably allocate this five die to this uh, sea serpent. Um, I'll allocate this to the pirate and this to the pirate. So I get a total of five attack which uh, equals this value here on Sun's Rest, which means I gain ownership over this particular isle. Never underestimate the word of a pirate. Because I've succeeded, I gain that number in spoils, which is really simply gaining uh, coins equal to that banner's value. So I get five coins, plus I get to also visit the isle. So I can exchange my fish for every worker I have on deck, to gain another sea serpent. I do, however, lose all of my uh, sea serpents that I've declared and pirates that I've declared during that attack. If for some reason I lose the attack and I actually don't win, I will need to sacrifice one of these creatures in order to, uh, I guess, retreat from my unsuccessful raid. You can actually injure one of your crew members by putting them in the below deck area and turning them face down to get extra attack strength. If I'm attacking an isle that's owned by another player, I'll need to make damage that is two more than the number written here on this banner. They say the Isle of Rockslide is in grave, grave danger. They say that a Dream Prowler is somewhere on the loose, wreaking havoc. Players may choose to ally or influence an Isle with a blue-green banner using influence cubes from the influence track. Sometimes diplomacy is more peaceful than attacking with brute force. And you can get influence cubes uh, by completing these story-based objectives. For example, you go to Grinnell, there's a bit of flavor text. Then you would need to complete the requirements outlined here. So you would tap a worker and pay four fish, and you'd be able to get three cubes to place on the influence track. You can also gain extra influence cubes by landing on aisles like Fell's Garden. Fell's Garden is a perfect place to put my feet up so I can see the green hills of Grinnell. What you would need to do is uh, try and resolve the event by paying this cost here at the bottom. So once I've traveled to Ganel and paid this cost, I would then uh, gain my three influence cubes and then place them in the next available spot in the influence track down below. I now have a total influence of five. I think the influence track is probably one of the game's most interesting mechanics. As you can see, if you complete those event cards and gain influence cubes early on in the game, the influence values that you're going to get are going to be pretty low. But if you hold out and time it just right, you'll be able to place these cubes somewhere on the track that will give you the highest influence values. Now vice versa when it comes to spending. When you're spending your cubes, it's better to choose the ones from the left to right so that if anyone places influence cubes after you, they'll have to fill up these spots first. If I were to ally with the town of Stratic, I would need to remove uh, cubes equal to the value of five influence points. I would remove my five influence from the influence track and collect spoils equal to the value written in the banner. If I wanted to ally with an isle owned by another player, I would need to pay two more than the influence value written on the isle. For the treasure, you'd gain all the coins from the treasure map. If there's no coins on the treasure map, this symbol here means you take one coin from the bank. Players may also wish to purchase a building from the building track as a free action on their turn. However, if you want to purchase any of these three buildings, you need to have acquired the book requirements to do so. The end game is triggered when one player has built eight buildings. When calculating end game scoring, each leftover coin on your ship is worth one renown. 
you need to total up the renown on all of your buildings that you've purchased in the game, resolve any end of game renown effects, add up your renown tokens, and add the position on the renown track to your final total. Uh, the symbols here refer to some of the bonus effects that you can get during the game. So these waves here mean that you can add one to the speed of your boat. The die here means you can exhaust that crew member to roll one extra die during combat. The eye here means that when you're attempting to influence or ally with an isle, you exhaust that crew member to gain one extra influence point. The other side of these crew tiles are used in Ryan Lockett's other game, Above and Below. Let's take a tour of some of these stunning isles. In the Isle of Borsham, for every timber that you have on your boat, you can trade it in for a pirate for every person that you have on your deck. Which pirate doesn't like wood? You have, if you add a coin to it, you can also exchange it for a sea serpent. I kind of view Farworld as like the capital city where you've got your government, you've got your parliament, and all your council members, and they all meet in this beautifully built up isle. And they make a lot of the decisions. It's the only R where you can actually complete the reputation cards. And they're symbolized by this trumpet symbol. So the person who activates it gets the first renown. But um, the reputation here is given to everyone who's playing the game. Isle of Stratic is really special because you can actually build a building without actually paying it in coins. You can actually use fish and timber in order to build a building. Investing in buildings in your isle is very important for building and establishing your metropolis. I want to give you an example of some of the cool synergy that occurs between the building cards and some of the isles on the game board. So if you buy this card here during the game, uh, you actually gain a renown for whenever you gain a book. Now, if you have the board set up so that Zillum is close to Thundrake and close to Fells Garden and the Grotto, you get this really interesting uh, curve effect. So what you would do is you'd go over to the Grotto and get your four fish, and assuming that you've built up your crew at the beginning of the game, you'd then be able to go to Zillum and exchange your fish and exhaust each crew member per fish that you have to gain multiple books. Then on your next turn you'll be able to go down to Thundrake and exchange all of those books for two Renown each and that would accelerate your progress on the Renown track gaining you multiple tiles and you might be able to pick up this from the Renown track which gives you two books which then synergizes back with this card so that whenever you gain um, a book you also gain a renown and then you would go back to the grotto to get more fish and you complete the cycle again. I picked a couple of these building cards to show you because I think they have some very interesting effects. So with the trade office when you visit a player owned town you don't pay the entry fee so I guess this card kind of cancels out that um, effect where if someone owns an isle you don't actually have to pay them anything. Uh, this one is all about the influence, so not only when you place a cube on the influence track you get the influence value, but you also get renown as well. This card allows you to gain I call the Sea Serpent. You're always guaranteed to get one damage uh, into your attack. Uh, not only that, if you get a 5 or 6, you can actually get 4 damage in as well. So I was fishing by the Isle of Sun's Rest when this huge sea creature startled me. My fishing line got hooked on that sea serpent's tail. You should have seen the look on Hogarth's face as I reeled that sea serpent in. What I really adore about Ryan Lockett's Islebound is the fact that if you've ever played the game Legend of Zelda Wind Waker, this game evokes that theme beautifully. You have your boat, you've got your supplies and your friends, and you look at your compass and you go into the horizon and sail to an isle and see what it has to offer. This is one of those uh, board games that really immerses you in the exploration theme. It is a free roaming board game where you can move your ship to wherever you like and each aisle has its own specific bonus and theme to it. There are so many options. On your first turn, uh, you could go to almost any aisle that you like 
and really uh, have a very different experience each time you play. I love how this game allows you to survey the map and see where things are and depending on where the bonuses are, you need to plan strategically about where you want to choose your home port and where you want to explore next. So developing a three turn plan is quite important before you realize it gets interrupted by other players who want exactly the same thing. I love how the tiles uh, can be rearranged on different games to uh, increase the variation. You could also flip the tiles over and use the advanced side, which provides for not a harder gameplay, but for a different style of gameplay. And the fact that the variants included in the rule book uh, do add to that replayable experience. One mechanism that I absolutely think shines in this game is the renown track. The renown track rewards you for gaining renown and completing a lot of the objectives. Trading in books, uh, resolving uh, the trumpet cards and completing the objectives and triggering uh, building effects. I just love how the stronger your aisle gets, the more rewards that you can obtain. And this creates a beautiful game curve in the game where you can gain renown that you need at the end of the game but also important resources as you go through. What is really great about this game is that there's many avenues for winning, choosing to convert books into renown, building buildings so you can uh, end the game quickly if you know that you are in the lead, uh, you can attack and use diplomacy to gain a plethora of coins, or to go to Farwell and trigger the renown effects by completing certain objectives. I really enjoyed the two player variant in this game. I'm really surprised that it wasn't actually mandated as a standard rule in the game because the closeness of having to exhaust an administrator when two ships are on the same hex tile really promotes uh, tougher decision making. It makes the game board feel a little bit tighter and stimulates a little bit more player interaction. It really stops players just from doing their own thing on the board. The three to four player game really shines because uh, there's only limited amounts of spaces and as you move your ships, you're going to have to have enough administrators to help you negotiate your spaces around the aisles. Beginning of the game, if you spend your money too much, you will soon realize that in this game, it is very hard to earn cash if you don't influence if you don't attack aisles, if you don't spend your money wisely, you can find yourself falling really far behind that, almost to the point of there's no way of climbing back in. I really like Ryan Lockett's storytelling mechanisms, especially his previous game, Above and Below. But this game, the storytelling mechanism comes more from the event cards and the flavor text that's, uh, that appears in those cards. And I think that there's not many event cards in the actual event deck. So if you play this about seven times, you're most likely to see the same events coming up again and again and again. But players can improv on the fly as they're playing the game and it comes down to players' creativity to how much story you want to add to it. The thing that would have been interesting would have been to experiment with each of the individual aisles to be printed on its own hex tile or triangular tile, and thereby players uh, could create their own map, their own shapes, and I think that would make for a more customizable experience. So there are too many expansions that you can add to Islebound that can extend its replay value. First of all, you can get Islebound Metropolis, where you can get additional buildings to use in the game, or you can get Islebound Deep Fog, which is an alternative way to play. And considering my final verdict, Ryan Lockett's Islebound is a free-roaming, seafaring game with a sense of adventure and a cornucopia of choices. The actions are not overly complicated, and the game plays very, very smoothly. It is hands down a fantastic family game and definitely one you should get. If you really like my review, please subscribe or follow me on Instagram. This is Danny signing up. Thank you for joining me again for another Board Game Sanctuary review.